Stewart, thank you for joining Roche Elite Moors and Shakers. Thank you and welcome to Sunseeker. Stuart, what would you say your success mindset is? Success mindset, really good question. Um, just to keep improving, be better at what you do, personally, business life, and every aspect of what you do. Just to be better. Um, Stuart, what would you say your tipping point was? Tipping point, I suppose, in, in personal life is the fact that I'm away from home. You know, my, my home patch is Edinburgh. Um, my main house is up in Edinburgh and I've got a second home down in Poole in Dorset. Yep. Um, and trying to balance personal home life with work life is always a bit of a challenge. Yep. Uh, in particular in this particular business of Sunseeker where travel, international travel is quite extensive. Sure. Uh, as far as business life is concerned, my fundamental tipping point and frustration <laughs> is regulation and political interference and in trying to uh, make a business improve and be better. Um, could you expand on that? I, th I think we, we all understand the regulatory environment, and particularly in the UK or in Eurozone in particular, where there's an ever-growing uh, raft of legislation which is designed to keep us all in check. Some sure. good, some bad, and people can all have their individual views and comments on it. For me, however, there is a, I agree with regulation. I have worked in financial services so I can understand significant parts of it. But we're in a, a luxury yachting sector, we're a preeminent world brand, and we're governed by more regulation than more people imagine. Mm -hmm. But the commercial environment in which we operate is moving and changing so fast that the, the regulatory environment and political environment is very slow, in my opinion, to reflect that change, adapt to the change, and give us the structures in which the regulation can cope with the change. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to continue for the foreseeable future. Right. So we spend, as a company, we spend more and more time with the relevant powers that be that are involved in the various regulatory issues. And for us, it covers everything from green issues to what you do with crew cabins and crew quarters and some of our luxury yachts. So we cover a wide spectrum. And because we have a product which gets sold to all five continents and over 60 countries, we, are, we have regulation which is specific to these territories. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're in a very complex environment and it's a real frustration to me that they're not either speaking together, mm -hmm. the regulators don't talk as mm -hmm. frequently as you should do. And we've got the Eurozone which is going down a very clear path as far as regulation goes. Um, and that may not be the same in other countries like South America or other continents like South America or other countries like Switzerland. Yeah. So in, in other words, the whole Yes Minister administrative side? Yes, and I, I think business has been asked to work its way out through the difficult circumstances that economies find them with themselves in, that I'm not so sure that governments of any colour, and not being political at yeah. all, are up to speed with that amount of change and providing the infrastructure that's required to make that path that little bit easier. Mm. And that's what's really required, isn't it? At that the is moment, fundamentally frankly. required. We have to make sure that the when there's a drive for business to pull us out of this very difficult series of three years we've had, uh, and there's, there's debate over what happens in 2012, but I think governments have got to pick up the pace of change and infrastructure development to make sure that we can, as a, as a country itself, and, and as a wider Eurozone, keep up to date with the demands and the pressures and the, the infrastructure issues we see in other continents. What do you think the government could do to um, ease the pressure and actually have a more of a, um, shall we say, um, turnaround focus as far as the red tape is concerned? I think, I think there's, been, there's been a lot of talk in the press over the last two to three years about uh, government, UK governments trying to cut red tape and rationalise certain things. I personally, on the ground, day to day involved in an active business, don't see any signs of that. Mm -hmm. I think any help along that route would be a huge advantage to us in the UK or I'd prefer to say Great Britain. We're still great, whatever people may think. Absolutely. And I think the challenge is to make sure that we make sure that Britain remains great and we are at the forefront of everything that's happening, both in regulation, in worldwide developments, in manufacturing developments and financial services. I'm not being critical of any one sector, but we've got to be able to manage our way out of this and be more proactive with the legislators, with government officials, with treasury officials, with you know, health and safety, all aspects of what we do in regulation. And we've got to try and make it quicker and sharper and more reflective of the current business.
business environment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I'd say I quite like the fact that you actually mentioned Great Britain and, and not forgetting that we are still great and we just need to uh, remember that a little bit, I think. Yes, we are. We're great. I'm a Scot, as people would probably gather from my accent, and uh, I'm a proud Scot and I'm a proud Brit. Yeah. Um, but we are Great Britain. Uh, although I'm a Scot, I work in the south of England. I travel quite extensively with what we do. But for me, it's Great Britain. And um, we intend to take that little thing a bit further. And even what we do, where you'll start to see the Union Jack appearing on some of our uh, printed literature or adverts and, and just generally what we do in, in a product which is steeped in British heritage of the marine sector. And that's something to be proud of. It's really it? proud. I'm, yes. I'm absolutely passionate about it. And uh, if I can help in any way, for me personally and what I do in life and what you do in business, to make the even minutest contribution to make sure that Britain remains great in its, uh, this difficult and challenging environment, then I'll feel happy. Indeed, and it's certainly the attitude that's required to get us out of this situation. Yes, we've got Full to be stop. more positive. Yes. I, I, I have a real frustration, you ask about frustrations earlier, but I have a real frustration about the amount of negativity we seem to see in all of our media, yeah. whether that be you know, live broadcasts, news reports and, and printed media. I think we should definitely go down a path of emphasising the positive side of life. We all know we're in difficult circumstances. We all understand we've got challenges to do, both personally. People are going to have to adapt to the circumstances of the economic environment in which we all live, operate and work. But I think we've definitely got to pick up the pace of more positivity through everything we do. And uh, for me, I, I have a personal frustration that the, the constant gloom and doom that seems to appear in everything we do, every day of the week. Absolutely. Yes. And I think we should do the complete opposite. Yeah, indeed. Portray the goodness, portray the highlights, whatever sector that happens to be in. Yes. Um, I personally, at the moment, I'm passionate about UK manufacturing, and we've got to do more to promote the good stories that we've seen in the car sector, airline sector, and other sectors, even the train sector, and yes. public transport bus manufacturer, train manufacturer, despite the pressures we've seen recently and some negativity of specific contracts in specific areas of the UK, we've got to promote it. And Indeed. here we are in Sunseeker, where we are, we think we are, and passionately believe we are, the world's preeminent luxury motor yacht brand. We export 100% of all our products. Um, our revenues have not dipped more than 10% over the worst part of the recession as we expand the business in manufacturing and we are seeing that part of Great Britain mm -hmm. um, in the south coast where we're currently actively recruiting up to 50 new apprentices. We are increasing our specialist design office teams. We've got a forecast increase in revenue in 2012 and beyond to 2013-14. And we see that, you know, to us that's a good story. Indeed. And we, we should promote good stories wherever we are. Yeah, absolutely. So what was your most challenging time uh, in personal and in business and how did you overcome that? Most challenging time personally was probably this particular position that I took up in Sunseeker was being away from home. Uh -huh. So it's the first time I've been permanently away from your home base, although I've travelled extensively throughout my business life, but it's a changed set of environment. And my son, I've got one son who he has moved to Portugal, so suddenly the family's been dispersed yeah. during the last couple of years. And that creates an interesting environment that you have to manage and deal with. Um, but it's just one of these things, that's life. I'm not the first, I'm not the last. And you just have to smile, be happy, get on with it. Yeah, indeed. Um, perhaps you spend more time in a plane than you would like, but that's fine. The business challenge is really about the delivery and the execution of our plan. We, we are in a very challenging market. We are a global business with global competitors and we operate in the environment of a true global business. So we have all the aspects of exchange rate issues, of taxation and fiscal issues, um, delivery issues, transport issues, as well as, you know, we sell in certain currencies, we buy goods in certain currencies, and we are a major contributor, I suppose, in our little world to, to what happens within our sector. Mm -hmm. So the, the challenges are really to be on top of that at all times because the last three years for me have proven beyond all doubt that things are changing ever more fast. I don't think that's going to stop. I think the pace of change is a continuum that we will see forever. And I've used internally 
um, the theme changes the steady state. In fact, we just had a dealer conference uh, last November and that was the whole theme of the conference. It changes normal. We've got to accept it changes with us daily, weekly, monthly, annually, in my view, forever. In other words, embrace change. We've got to embrace change in everything that we do and whether it's our expectations of lifestyle, our expectations of income personally, our expectations as a business, our expectations in how much time, work-life balance, I think everything's going to change. And we've got to be aware that the, the impact of change is not just in the UK or Great Britain, as we like to call it. Um, it's more what happens in other territories. Different countries that we operate in and sell in have different attributes, they've got different employment law, they've got different lifestyles, mm -hmm. they've got different views of lifestyles and they've got different views of corporate lifestyles. But we just have to live with that, we just yeah. got to move on, Indeed. accept it, learn from it. And if we can learn every month and every year and every week, then we can all get better. Indeed. Take the good and kill the bad. Yeah. Um, so what, um, it's interesting that you have so much of um, uh, views that are actually based on facts as opposed to uh, just views per se. Uh, so could you, uh, I would, I'm interested in knowing your background. Yeah, I, I, I'm obviously, I'm born, bred, schooled, educated in Scotland. I right. come from Edinburgh originally. Um, my main home's still up in Edinburgh. Um, I'm an accountant by profession, uh -huh. although I have never practiced accounting in an accountancy firm. Um, I trained the long way around with Associated British Foods uh -huh. and to me the training that I got with the best part of 10 years there was the best I could have ever asked for. They were an exceptional business to work for. The scope and exposure you got to a multi-site, multi-environment, multi-product, complex business, for me learning to be an accountant was outstanding. And what I've managed to do is, I, I, from that I've learned how a business works. So my skill set really how a business hangs together. Having the accountancy background has been a tremendous help in understanding balance sheets and numbers and all the usual things that, sure. that people would accept. But I think, having had experience in several sectors of both manufacturing and professional, legal and financial services sectors, has given me a breadth which I personally have found useful to be calm. Mm -hmm. I think you've got to try and make yourself calm. Everybody can have good days and bad days and be spiky and have thorny issues that they're less than comfortable with and that's again that's just part of life. But for me I have worked hard to try and keep calm, balanced and try to just understand a problem and see there's always a solution in my head somewhere. You've got to find that solution and see how you can apply the solution. Um, and I try to keep positive. Sometimes it's very difficult um, and the pressures can get to anyone, you know, whether that Absolutely. be personal or, or business life. And my answer to that is I go away in escapism. So sailing's my hobby. I have a, a small boat that I just drift away myself and please myself. And uh, I, I, I take some of my frustrations out in going to live sport. I'm a passionate believer in going to live events like that rather than watch them on television. And um, I think the balance, the combination of trying to get the work life is important mm -hmm. and trying to work at remaining calm. If, if you can get in your head that there is a general assumption that there's, there has to be a solution, we've got to make a solution, I think having that, a balance of more positivity than negativity definitely helps. And some accountants are accused of being negative and yeah. <laughs> bookworms and perhaps applying the textbook and the rules too much. Indeed. And I think there's a balance in every profession, but for me, it's all about trying to maintain that level of positivity wherever you are, whatever you're doing and whatever environment you're in. So what's the trend line far as your sector is concerned at the moment? That's another interesting question. Um, trends are very difficult to predict in the current environment, but for us, we see there has been a significant amount of corporate activity within the global yachting sector mm -hmm. over the last 18 months or two years. I think there'll be further corporate activity. There's been some recent announcements uh, just this month, in fact, about more corporate activity, both in the manufacturing side of the product and on the supply chain right. to the product. But for me, we see that the sector, our customer base is predominantly high net worth or mass affluence. Mm -hmm. And it's clear that every country 
has affluence and high net worth. And we're seeing that I think we're at the bottom of the plateau. Uh, we managed to contain our revenue uh, FY10 to FY11 was only down 8%. Um, we are seeing an increase in revenues, an increase in margins, an increase in headcount and employee headcount over the course of the next two years. And we see that the green shoots of recovery are definitely in place, but the cycle of these green shoots are very, very territorial dependent. Uh -huh. Different okay. countries are in different parts. If we see what's happened in 2011, if you take the Mediterranean ring of countries, for example, everybody knows what's happened in the Arab Spring, yes. everybody knows what's happened in Libya or in Egypt, and that has a negative effect on our market. But for every time we see negative, there is positive coming from South Africa, from Mauritius, from the Seychelles, from China, Hong Kong, Brazil. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the expansion of our territories and the, the global reach of the business will see a different cycle to certain other sectors within the UK. Mm -hmm. And these trends, I think, will continue. We are seeing, we're still seeing impulse buying of very expensive yachts. Uh, we're seeing no real change to the type of consumer. We've still got a spread of consumers from the young to the old. Mm -hmm. And we're in a business, our particular business, the Sunseeker, has a 70 plus percent repeat customer base. And it's very interesting to track these customers and what happens to them personally in their business life and in each country, because they've all got different aspects. And I think we see the mix from our customers. Some are less positive, some are more positive. But I'm a passionate believer that the macroeconomic situation of growth versus recession is exactly that, it's macroeconomic. Mm -hmm. In each country, in each continent, there are different sectors which will grow or shrink at different cycles, whether the macroeconomic position is growth or whether it's recessionary. I think in our sector, for our business and our brand, we do not see the variations that others in our sector have seen. Right. And we put that down to the crucial part of new product development. And we are, and we have embarked, we're sitting on the 28 meter new launch of our boat this year. This is a circa five million pounds yacht. Uh, this boat has only been launched this month, January 2012 in London. It's sold out for 12 months. Uh, by, the, by the end of these 12 months, one of these boats will be in all five continents, or at least one of these boats. So we're seeing the geographical spread. There's not a product concentration. There's not a territory concentration. So we are embarking on the fastest and most aggressive new model and refresh program that this company has ever undertaken in its 50 year history. And we are absolutely committed to making sure we deliver that at the same time as listen to the client demands. What we find is that over 90% of our boats are tailored to a customer demand. Mm -hmm. And that's what the challenge is. Yeah. Matching the tailoring and bespoke nature of some of the things that we do versus the generic manufacturing business where you always look for scale and efficiencies and you know methodology becomes a key issue driving margin. But we're doing it through being more efficient in the process, making sure the boats are designed on time, on plan, to a budget, and to the quality standards which we expect the Sunseeker brand to deliver. We've managed to do that during the last 18 months, and the next 18 months to two years we'll see an even bigger increase. And as well as the general new models that you see about here today, where we've got two launched at the London Boat Show, we are creating an entry-level product of a 40-foot Portofino, which will be launched in July 2012 right and that boat has already been sold out for the following 12 months production and at the opposite end of the spectrum we're currently got in build the biggest boat we've ever built it's a 155 foot 20 million pound approaching product and uh, where we're sold boat number one and we're in pretty advanced discussions with subsequent boats and these products you can only build one a year mm -hmm. um, versus some boats you can build one every six or eight weeks so we find the spectrum is growing of our product range and then that's overlaid with the number of new models and product refreshes that we're doing, which to be fair, other luxury branded goods are doing. We are no different in my view uh, and we're seeing that ourselves in the UK, we're back to Great Britain again. Yes. What's making Britain great or contributing to the addition of 
or the expansion of Great Britain is we're seeing other car manufacturers, for example, where they're launching aggressive new model changes. And, you know, the best one sitting here in front of us, probably the Range Rover Evoque, which in itself is a, an interesting product with huge customer demand and interest from, again, worldwide economies. So we're passionate about the whole thing. We've got to make sure we can get labour. Yep. So we're embarking on the recruitment of up to 50 apprentices to train ourselves. Mm -hmm. And you, you reflect back on earlier comments about frustrations and political frustrations on vocational qualifications is one of my pet hates. Right. And I think the country's shrunk these at the expense of universities. Yeah. And we're finding a labour market being very difficult in certain areas. And, and we're trying to recruit our own and expand the business through our own, our own work. We get no assistance, we get no grants, we get no help and support from any trade bodies or government bodies or help in any aspect. This is a business which is funded on its own, managed by its own resources, developed through its own resources using the British marine heritage, the, the work of the founders and the designers of the business through to this next change of developing it for the next 50 years. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting manufacturing story where we probably don't get enough publicity for ourselves, being honest, our personal view. We don't complain about that because we just continue to plough our own furrow. Um, and we're seeing that that's getting us through the next stage. We see growth in revenues, earnings, margin, and employee numbers for the next 24 months. Marvellous. We can't say any more than that. No, absolutely We think not. that's a good yeah. story. And um, we'll see a pickup in the UK market, so our exports will go from 100% to you know, 98, 95% perhaps as we change the model cycle. But we think it's a good story. Fantastic. And we should concentrate on good, happy stories. What's your view on um, the current economic upturn? That's probably the, uh, the most interesting question of all, I would say. Um, if we take the UK, the UK is obviously going through a difficult series of economic circumstances. Which we are where we are, we're in these circumstances. For me, I don't look back, we've just got to think how we get forward and get out of this. Absolutely. And I think it'll be led, as usual, by a combination of factors. But this country has to get to grips with increasing its manufacturing output. I think there was perhaps a sense of apathy appearing on the reliance on financial services and I mean the wider financial services not just the banks but insurance and all the ancillary businesses that were come under the umbrella of financial services and I think we forgot that Great Britain is still a great manufacturing country mm -hmm. we just don't manufacture enough yes so what I would like to see is more emphasis more support I'm not being judgmental on how that support should be delivered or what government interference or intervention should happen but I think we've got to make sure that the the delivery of quality manufactured products is maintained not just for the next two to five years to get out of this cycle but in perpetuity mm -hmm. we should make that a complete focus of getting back to the great British tradition of manufacturing mm -hmm. and that's not to say a total concentration of manufacturing because we still need infrastructure, we still need retail, we still need financial services. We need all of these components of an sure. economy to work. But they will all operate in different cycles. So the macroeconomic cycle and the microeconomic cycle for each sector will vary. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And coming back to my theme of change is a steady state, I think we just have to accept that. Indeed. Change is normal in all these sectors. Yes. What's your, uh, what's your opinion on, um, a lot of people are already starting the whole doom, doom and gloom uh, of 2012 or predicting that it's going to be um, still doom and gloom. Now I don't really buy into it personally. What's your opinion on it? I, I think the doom part of it will be the, the individual consumer in the economy will come under disposal income pressures. Yeah. And I think we can now see certainly some visibility. The government's made their position quite clear, and that's fine, we've got to operate within it. I think we're seeing a bit more clarity on interest rates remaining more stable. It's been at its longest time ever mm -hmm. at the current levels. Whether that's right or wrong is for others to debate. Yes. So I think the doom part will be the consumer being more conservative in how they spend their money, how they treat savings, 
and how they treat debt. But I think we'll go through that cycle quicker than we imagine. And I, I have a very simple view. I think people get fed up being fed up. <laughs> so we have, to, we have to change and become more optimistic in trying to deliver more positivity than negativity, but understanding that there'll be a lot of people under a lot of pressure. You know, everybody's not as fortunate as we are, Indeed. sitting here, or as Sunseeker are. Yeah. And we understand that. There's been a lot of stress businesses just announced this year. Absolutely. Post-Christmas trading being uh, pressure points, but equally Christmas trading has been positive for some retailers. Absolutely, very positive. And it's been very positive for us. We've seen a significant movement in our order book from November through to January. Um, so again, we just we just got to try and lift ourselves out of this, the doom part of it, and be more positive. It's difficult, it's challenging, but we've just got to help each other, make sure we can try and create employment, create the products that people want to buy, and hopefully, when we come through this and we go through the next cycle, that the the debt cycle and the pressures that we're put on people will not reoccur. Mm -hmm. That we need to make sure that we're more balanced. And I think that's when I touched on earlier about the expectations of people's income and reward and lifestyles. Maybe we've just got to all accept. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a bit more challenging. We might see a decrease in living standards for a period of time. But you know, maybe that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe we've just got to accept a wee bit sense of reality, move on, smile, try and get through it, and all work together create jobs and move on. Yeah, that way increasing the GDP. It increases the GDP the... ultimately. Manufacturing has a, probably the quickest way to increase GDP if we can increase our exports. Indeed. We increase employment, as we're doing, I think we will see, on an optimistic sense, we could see our headcount up by 5% year on year. So we employ 2,300 staff. So if we can contribute 5% increased employment, as other companies, like the, the, the high-end car manufacturers are seeing an increase in headcount, that I think it's all contributory and that will put money back into the economy, it increases the tax, it reduces or helps to reduce unemployment or mitigate unemployment and we've just got to keep doing what we can do best. Absolutely. So we concentrate on what we're doing best and let our uh, political system and our, our regulatory system hopefully come up to the pace quicker. Indeed and reflect the changes quicker and let's work in tandem. We should yes. be all working in harmony. We'll all have disagreements. We can agree to disagree. Absolutely. But ultimately, we've got to pick up the positivity and move on. Indeed, indeed. And also, I think it's quite interesting that you say that because as uh, far as the last recession is concerned and the companies that actually spend the most in, in shall we say, growth and marketing and so on and so forth, actually became the market, marketing leaders, essentially, or market leaders on that acquisition strategy. So... Yeah, that's an interesting... We, we're doing exactly the same. We're investing more in research and development and product development than we've ever done. Yeah. Because we see that as the only way to work our way out. But that's also using research from client demands from the countries out with Great Britain. Yeah. You know, we export virtually all of our product. Yes. So we have to reflect the customer demands in other countries and the fiscal issues in other countries. Indeed. Um, and we have some very, very penal fiscal regimes on luxury yachts, as you can imagine. And even within Eurozone, different countries are putting in new tax regimes to try and get additional tax out of our sector. Yes. I think it's regressive, personally. It's a frustration. It's yeah. a tipping point for me. <laughs> and I don't understand why governments are trying to go that route when they should be encouraging trade, encouraging activity, and, you know, I'm a passionate believer in reducing tax rates will ultimately increase the tax take. Indeed, indeed. Um, so, but we are where we are. We've got to manage where we are. Um, and we just need to make sure we continue to do it. But we have to bring back a research of where we sell our product, who uses our products, the service and support functions, back to this country so that we manufacture and therefore deliver the growth that we can based as a UK, 100% UK manufacturer. Stuart, what is your current focus? Our focus is to make the business more efficient and deliver the products that the consumer are demanding. We are expanding all aspects of our business, including our real estate infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And the core of that focus is the new product development program. And currently we make products from 48 foot to 132 foot. And we're expanding that spectrum to go from 40 foot to 155 foot. So we're increasing the spectrum and range of models that we produce. 
and at the same time making new product. So already today we're sitting on the 28 metre, we've launched the 53 Predator, we've got a 40 foot Portofino coming out in July, and we've got a 101 foot Predator coming out, we've got a 68 foot boat coming out, 155 foot boat coming out, all within the cycle, and that's just new product. On top of that, we're doing a refresh of the complete model range over a two year cycle. So we see that this complete concentration and focus on new product and new technologies, new materials, innovative designs, uh, looking at what we can do with it. You know, this boat has got a lot of carbon fiber on it, mm -hmm. which makes it lighter, it's, it's more fuel efficient, and all aspects of what we do, technology, we're using the apps on this for controlling the, the systems in the, the boats. It's, it's, it's a complete innovation. And I know mm -hmm. we've got a Department of Business Innovation and Skills. And I, I think we are actually quite distant from government bodies on that. And that's not a criticism. It's just sure. something we can work on to, to try and improve. And we've actually done that during the course of this week. But the, the name is actually right, Business Innovation and Skills. And the combination of those three actually will what make this business better. Yeah. So we're improving our business, we're trying to be innovative in all aspects, whether it be materials or product design or fabrics and interior looks. And the skills, as I said earlier, we are in the process of recruiting up to 50 new apprentices. Mm -hmm. We're recruiting new specialists in uh, graphic design, in 3D modeling, in all aspects of what we do, which is designed to combine, to work with the existing business to expand it into the next arena. Right. So that when you take that business innovation and skills and you apply it into the real life of a business, sure. the core description is correct. It's how you execute it and how you deliver that. If I had one concern, or using your word before, of a tipping point, it would be, I, I think we will see geographic pockets of skill shortages. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's been a problem driven four or five years ago by the cut in apprentice training and the drive to universities. Right. We need everything Indeed. in an economy, and in a modern economy that's competing with expanding economies, particularly the BRIC countries. Sure. I think we have to readdress that and have a look at how we mix our education system with business yep. ever more closely. And I know most business people are on that case. In other words, the balance us, works both. For us, we're in an area of relatively low employment we have to have manufacturing facilities near a waterfront, naturally, um, and that gives us certain constraints and certain planning's more difficult. Um, the choice of opportunity for real estate is more difficult. Uh, planning restrictions are horrendous for us in trying to develop the business. The road network's horrendous when we're shifting big product about yes. in public highways. Especially one of these. So Especially one of these, because this can't go by road at all. Um, and these infrastructure issues in the area we, we live and work in, in Poole and Dorset, it creates its different situations that we have to manage. And you know, in the northeast and the northwest and the Midlands will equally have their different issues. But we've got to work with the community. We've got to get closer to the business, innovation and skills teams, hopefully locally. Mm -hmm. I think they're too centralised at the moment. So we have to get that thought process and connectivity and feedback uh, more frequent, more structured, so that again, using this theme of helping each other, building with each other, and trying to assist that change is here to stay. Mm -hmm. We don't know how much that change will impact us all, we don't know the speed of change, but it will be change. And I think we're all gonna have to work together to see it. Absolutely. So, for us, all about new product, and all about taking the three things of business, innovation and skills, combining them to create the product that we think we can sell throughout the world. Fantastic. Stuart, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It has indeed been a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Oh, you're welcome.